freccetta davanti, torna indietro, questa, questa qua, davanti, indietro, puntatore, cioè, della casa, puntatore della casa, allora, eh, quello che dicevano è che se vuoi usare il gelato, va meglio perché questo quando ti giri non giri, se vuoi te lo accendo subito, che era spento, dovrebbe essere funzionale tutto pronto e tu quando arrivi tac che tac che siamo scegliamo se facciamo solo una, una piccola verifica qui quando tu fai arrivo su ecco ed è la regia ed è la regia che eh, quando noi vediamo se lo schiavo una cosa che la vita funziona benissimo No, è così. Tengono aria condizionata bassa. <ride> Ma no, in realtà qui è molto più smaccata la cosa, vogliono risparmiare. la cravatta eh. Sì, sì, me la tolgo anche per fortuna di che siamo sarò un po' di adesso la gente me la tolgo anche io aspettavo magari ho visto anche tanta gente ho visto molto sì, sì, sì. physique duro beh possiamo iniziare Si suda. Cominciamo? Buongiorno a tutti e benvenuti a questo... Un momento, non abbiamo ancora detto nulla. Calma. Allora, benvenuti a questo incontro sulla nanomedicina. So, good morning, good morning. Welcome to this meeting on nanomedicine. Nothing is more close to the human heart as the desire to know and understand reality and change reality to one's advantage, to one's benefit. Scientific knowledge is an important part of this process of knowledge to get to know more reality. What is interesting is that during this process, we all change, we get, become more aware of our limitations and the limitations of reality itself. This is very interesting because people who take this seriously and who take seriously this desire to know more reality, this astonishment in front of reality, and who use scientific tools to deepen this knowledge, then they end up being very much changed. This is exactly the reason why for today we have invited these two outstanding callers to talk to us at the Rimini meeting. We have here uh, two people that uh, have used scientific tools uh, to get to know better reality and 
they actually do it as a profession. As a profession, it's their job. Professor Marco Pierotti, working in Milan, and Professor Mauro Ferrari, professor and chairman of the Department of Nanomedicine and Biomedical Engineering at the University of Texas. <coughs> So the specific topic for today is nanotechnologies and nanomedicine. Professor Ferrari can be considered as the inventor of nanomedicine. It's a specific field of research that will soon uh, have a strong impact on many sectors of medicine, both in terms of diagnosis and treatments. So it is with great interest that we will soon be listening to Professor Ferrari, he will not only introduce us to uh, the outcome of his research, but also about his experience as a researcher and scholar. So let me give the floor to Marco Pierotti, who will talk to us about the diagnosis and treatment of uh, tumors, starting from our knowledge on the human <coughs> genome. Okay, perfect. Intanto, buongiorno a tutti. So first of all, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Marco, for this short introduction. Thank you, Mauro Ferrari, for accepting my invitation. It all started uh, during a conversation with myself and Giancarlo Cesana, where we thought that maybe there's the great desire to uh, know more things. And it all comes from desidera the stars, so it's a strong desire that connects us with the infinite, with the, with the sky. Well, technology has greatly changed what we know about these things, much more than other disciplines. Therefore, what I would like to attempt to do for to the Taking, uh, talking about technologies and give you an idea of the state of it, state of the art of oncological research, Ta uh, starting from the tumors, as, and talking about molecular medicine. So understand more about these mechanisms, and I will. <coughs> talk to you about a few ideas, then Professor Ferrari will talk to us about the great leap forward which is expected when these new nanotechnologies will be implemented. Now, because Marco said, talk, say something about yourself, how this profession changed you as persons, then I have to say that although it is an embarrassment that I've had the privilege and the great luck of sharing a few moments with Don Giussani and his invitation uh, to do this job implies two limitations. Don Giussani had told me, you go on, continue being a researcher until you will be astonished about what you are discovering and, and especially until the moment when you are aware that everything that you discovered is given to you, it's not your merit. Now, after 40 years, I think uh, these two things are still true, therefore I will continue to do this job. Now, before moving on to the central part of my topic, that has to do with the state of the art of, our, of what we know about tumors, I would like to say something differently at the outset. In a few months, next February, we will celebrate the 10th anniversary of two very important pieces, of, uh, papers published on science and nature. They were both published in the year 2001, 10 years ago, and they had to do with the decoding of the human genome. This was a fundamental step forward with great implications on the medical field. So very, very significant. And it is very close to one of the two main questions, who we are and where are we going? The, the DNA and its architecture uh, can provide us with answer that is uh, alarming to some, interesting to others. For some, it's a personal involvement. Anyway. 
What we had fa found out is that between us and anthropomorphic monkeys, that we are very, very similar. 98% of our DNA is in common. Now, I don't want to go into details. Does this mean that we are all chimpanzees, all monkeys? I mean, now, among all the questions uh, for true scientists, why is that this identity leads to differences? Now, there are three things that the evolutionary scientists have taught us. First, man is the only human being uh, that besides a biological evolution also had a cultural evolution. I think many important meetings <laughs> took place here at the Rimini meeting. It's very interesting to get to know the development of the human brain uh, um, and also the ability of developing language skills. This is very important. I mean, you can convey to a two-year-old boy thousands of years of ac acquired knowledge. This is only true for the human beings and not for monkeys. Second thing, we are all able to develop tools that will be used to develop even more sophisticated tools. So we end up changing our tools and, and we can uh, develop things that are smaller and smaller. And then there is a third question that remains unanswered. I think there is some room left for the heart and the heart is distinctive of the human being. The other thing which has always struck me very much, and here I will conclude my introduction, is the fact that while astrophysicists are very lucky because they can always make reference to the Big Bang, the start of everything, I mean, time has not been with us uh, since always, I mean, there is a before and an after. Carlo Rubia recently said that the living matter is made up by molecules, amino acids, etc., and proteins. Well, in nature, in a laboratory, you can synthesize amino acids, and when they are hit by polarized light, they deviate this light to the right or to the left. And when you analyze amino acids in nature, you uh, discover something very interesting. All the amino acids of the living matter are levogyrous. So at the root of light, there is one single element. This last slide uh, pr introduces uh, another subject, the origin of man, a monocentric origin. While any other theory on case or necessity cannot be explained with this theory. I mean, maybe men could have born in different circumstances. There are polymorphisms, that is to say different. It's one gene that expresses different in different people. Um, for instance, the color of our hair that can be related to the same gene. The Y chromosome, or the role of the mitochondria, cellular microorganism that we only inherit from our mothers. And as you see in this slide, the origin of men has been established as being monocentric. Adam and Eve were created, they started all off from Africa and then they spread around the world. I mean. What we know about these programs of science has to do with the sequencing and the decoding of the human genome. Everything started in 1990. The idea uh, was that it would have lasted for 15 years for a total cost of $200 million a year for a, uh, the work of about 1,100 researchers. We then saw that progress, tec the technology helped progress very much, great leap forward. Uh, times, I mean, it took a much shorter time and also costs have been greatly reduced and nowadays 
one genome is worth one thousand dollars. And while in the past it would take about 100 days to sequence one entire genome, now it only takes one week and no longer 100 days. Do you see this slide is that the English very much happy about technological developments. This is a stamp in 2003 where they introduced the concept of a genome medical features. Now, moving on to the heart of my presentation, what I can tell you for sure is that the model that we have that that can better explain tumor is a disease of the genes of the cell which does not simply take place in one specific moment but rather it's the consequence of the accumulation in one cell of a series of lesions that have to do with fundamental genes for the growth and development of the normal cell. There has been a recent presentation in a paper in, of, in an American literature uh, talking about enemies within, so the enemies are inside. So unlike other diseases where we have infectious agents from outside or traumatic injuries, etc., cancer is the other side of the coin of the complexity of our cells. It's an enemy from within, from inside, tiny lesions accumulating in time, and then thanks to the recent technologies of, for sequencing our DNA, I also have to add that the, the changes of these genes in the va for the vast majority are related to the interaction between our own genome and the environment, the surrounding environment, therefore pollution, lifestyles, etc. Less than 10% is due to inherited genes, so for tumors uh, considered as inherited disease like hemophilia, muscular dystrophy, etc. And then there is little space for those spontaneous events due to specific features of the DNA that can mutate and whose repair mechanisms are not effective. This is the f first generation technology, is very costly, hundreds of millions of dollars, and at least two days for one million bases, the genome, genome I mean, the full sequence of the genome would require 100 days. We all started dealing with cancer with, with this instrument starting from starting from the model of genes which are altered. And we got to know the complete structures of, of entire gen genic families. I mean, this slide has to do with the kinase that play a vital role in the growth, differentiation, and cellular death. They can either be inactive or inactive. Form. The active form is very well regulated. In cancer, this form is always active. And this is what makes the difference. This is what makes the difference. Now, with this new sequencing technology, we encountered many problems right from the beginning. First of all, because a cellular cell can acquire tens or hundreds of mutations, and the those that are relevant for the development of the, the disease are only a few tens. Therefore, we, we have to distinguish between the driver mutations from those that we consider passengers' mutations that are not dangerous. The other uh, problem is that within the same tumor, sometimes uh, certain metastatic deposits of the very primary tumors have different lesions. So there is a serious problem of heterogeneity. We had already seen, with reference to the sequencing of the genome, that was something that struck us very much. Two things. Firstly, the number of genes seem not to matter very much. We have fewer genes than other species, fewer than some plants. So, it, so the number of genes seem to be not very much important. And then, that there, there, there is a lot of DNA which is called junk DNA that doesn't seem to code for anything. So we thought maybe the problem doesn't lie in the hardware, in the architecture of DNA, but rather in the software. So how are these genes controlled in their expression? Are they turned on or turned off? That's why we started with a new generation of microtechnologies, not yet nanotechnologies, where we can uh, um, 
study an entire genome to find out which are the genes that are expressed and we can compare it with the tumor cell or the healthy cell to find out whether the differences were um, more or less compared to the mutations. Going back to the genome, may I recall that Francis Collins, one of the fathers of the DNA decoding, when he published his first book, he said that man is something more than just the sum of his own genes. So the ability to assess this expression led to a technology, and especially if we look back at the past 10 years, a technology which is now superseded, a very simple technology. And this technology would allow us to add molecules that can uh, radiate light with a specific frequency, so we can put some flags on the RNA, which is the translation of the DNA so that the DNA transforms into a protein. We have this mm, intermediary phase, mRNA, and we can put a green flag if it's related to the cellular th and red if it is related to the normal cell. We then mix these cellular species. We put them on a, sl on a slide that can contain up to 20 or 30,000 tiny spots, which are genes that we can then study to understand those that are expressed in the tumor and those that are normal. You see here the presentations on a logarithmic scale, but in the we end up having a hit map which can tell us whether that sample or that specific is expressing or not, whether we whether the green is prevailing or whether the red is prevailing. This is the type of equipment that we were using then. As I said, absolutely super CD. We currently use tiny machines, very similar to the most modern coffee machines. We can uh, study all the genes expressed by one cell as if it was a jukebox. I mean, you can put like a coin in, and then you pull the handle, and then you get the information in return. So information is to be processed into culture. Anyway, this information is quite complex. This is a heat map of a few hundred tumors, and the study has to do with 5,000 genes, more than one million pieces of information. This is biology mixed with computer science. Bioinformatic, it's becoming a discipline on its own. This is not the end of the story. 97% of the DNA which people thought to be of no use, thanks to these technologies, we find out that it is, on the contrary, very useful. Two cellular types that we, didn't, we knew nothing about, microRNA, and then and the small interference RNA. Both these species are very important. They do not produce proteins, but they make up that interaction network between genes explaining that the complexity does not lie in the number of genes, but rather in their interactions. This, uh, this is a study on microRNAs in colorectal cancer, showing that the same microRNA, maybe, believe me, believe me, the same RNA can control uh, a series of different genes, some leading to cellular growth and some don't. And this 97% of DNA, which seems to be of no use, has to do with this ultra-preserved uh, um, repetitive structures in the various species, which are like sponges to take away from the environment these, these RNAs and changing these mechanisms, these balances. This to give you an idea of this interaction, I think that the genes uh, are, uh, never function on their own. They belong to pathways that can be assimilated to, can be very similar to a map of the underground with all the different st stations. This is the interaction of the different cellular pathways. For instance, if one of the underground stations is uh, closed for works, uh, of course, it's impossible to go from one point to another. Once one gene is done away with, all the genes that are along that pathway are also done away with. 
On the contrary, if this gene is, is stressed in its function, then all the other genes will be equally stressed, will be equally enhanced. This to give you an idea of the network. Now, oncology in the third millennium, molecular diagnosis, this is the simpler level, as, as often uh, the first stage preclinical level, the first sector to be impacted is diag diagnostic. This is the past. And in the past, we only had a morphological diagnosis. You look at this slide, you find the tumor, you, we can find out it's uh, infiltrating ductal breast cancer, for instance. And then we, we got to a molecular diagnosis, a very simple one, gene by gene, which will then lead to a specific treatment. The new scenario is the following. Thanks to these high throughput tools and the reduced cost, we can um, characterize the molecular structure of every tumor for every single patient. And this leads to a molecular classification, which in turn entails a new classification that goes beyond the limits of morphology. It's a cl classification of tumors that is based on molecular medicine. Quite just a few examples. So this slide will tell you ductal infiltrate on tumor of the breast. Well, when we talk about um, genic expression in terms of microtechnologies, we find out that we can establish mm, clear subgroups for different conditions whereby the outcome is the same. It is indeed a breast cancer, but the ways to get to diagnosis are different. This implies very significant difference also because the treatment, this explains why the same treatment would function at least further in some women with this type of tumor and not in other women. Second possibility, we can predict whether that specific tumor at the time will be highly aggressive, therefore requiring uh, aggressive treatment, or a more benign evolution. So the prediction on the genic expression with reference to the aggressiveness of the tumor, and also we'll be able to establish whether the tumor will infiltrate other organs. Now, the knowledge of the molecular profile has led us to develop new drugs which are no longer based on differential cytotoxicity between tumor and healthy cells, but rather on the mechanisms which had generated the tumor. For the first time in the history of oncology, we can really hope of treating tumors thanks to the mechanism, the very same mechanism that generates that generate the disease. So some paradigms which we had thought would never change. So one drug for every uh, disease. Well, here we have more predictability because some uh, tumors can be treated with the same paradigm. And here I put the paradigm of the imatinib, which uh, turned to be very useful for chronic myeloid leukemia and other diseases. Then another thing, same tumor must be treated with the same drug. This has to do with the tumor. The molecular profile of tumor imposes a certain therapy. And then there is a third frontier, and here we have great expectations from nanotechnologies. The final product, the final protein, to develop that within the same tumor or metastases of the same tumor, we can find different molecular uh, profile here for the drug industry. We would like uh, treatment with different targets. Now, on the the economist a few years ago had written the, the, about the new frontiers of molecular medicine, and this is now the new scenario for molecular medicine or medicine of the four Ps. This is the definition invented by Leroy Hood. This new molecular medicine will have to be predictive, predict the evolution of a disease, the course of a disease, preventive, so chemo prevention, even prior to the onset of the disease, personalized in terms of treat treatment and participatory, participatory. Uh, I mean, now the focus is a lot on the person, the person at the center. Participation implies the associations of patients. This is all very good, but you should never forget it is, it is always the single person to be at the center of this process. Now, from all the various omics to the 
system treatment and then nanotechnologies will be the fundamental tool to do this. This slide is to remind you all of what's already present in the fourth uh, uh, century. Cosmos, Anthropos, Micros, Cosmos, so man as the s summary of the universe. This is the Milky Way, thousands of kilometers away, nanotechnologies that work from 10 to minus 9, and men kind of halfway. Thank you very much. Grazie, Marco, chiarissimo. Invito subito Mauro Ferrari a fare lo suo. Thank you very much for your clear presentation, and now the floor goes to Mauro Ferrari for his presentation. Allora è molto difficile. Now, it's not easy to take the floor after such a good speaker, especially for somebody like myself. Also my Italian after 26 years in the US, my Italian is now very poor. Please apologize if I'm not a brilliant speaker, anyway. Because I have been invited to talk about scientific aspects, nanomedicine, nanotechnologies, but also on my behalf something personal. I would like to mention the heart again. We cannot mention the heart without mentioning something about ourselves. Now, oh, because we are here, no, it's, it's the first time that I am here at the Rimini meeting, but I've been told that there's always a meeting between friends, friends that have the faith, that have faith in common, that share the same beliefs, therefore with great, great emotion, Excuse me, I would like to tell you about something that have to do with our ways. Now, to start with, first slide, just to give you an idea of what I am currently doing, at least for the time being. I have not been fired, actually, I don't know, but because there has been a change, because things evolve, and talking about ways and pathways, uh, as I said, there is an ev evolution, and the evolution lies in this new institution. I will be CEO of this new institution. I will be now president and CEO of the Methodist Hospital Research Institute, this new research institute a huge hospital, more than 1,000 researchers, more than 700 clinical trials. It's an independent institution based in Houston. It is also part, uh, in, based in Houston. So I will uh, move from the University of Texas to this new hospital. Now, Maria Luise, in this picture, 21 years old. We had met a few, uh, a few months earlier, and a few months later, we were on a beach on a honeymoon trip. I, at the time, I was 24 years old, so a long time ago, 24. And I want to tell you something about her story. We got married and I have to admit it's the first time that we actually ran away from home we ran away from home I've never told this anyone I mean this is one of those stupid things that you do when you are young 
And then when you look back at it, you say, how could I possibly have been so stupid anyway? And now something funny to break the ice again many years ago. I come from a family where no one had ever gone to university, so the idea of studying was a risk, it was a new thing. So I received a grant to go to Berkeley, huge university with 17 Nobel Prizes. I had only just met Maria Luisa, and the idea of leaving her, the idea of leaving her was obviously not a good Anyway, we speeded up things, got married, went to California, Berkeley, where I, sta I wrote my dissertation, remained there for 15 years, and then I ended up being a, a professor. Actually, at the beginning I was studying mathematics, then in Berkeley I did a PhD in engineering, and this is the day of my PhD graduation, just for a laugh. I th if my students or my colleagues would see this today, I think they would kick me out. I am, I'm, I'm presentable. Look at how Maria Luisa was dressed. I mean, she would never buy anything. She would sew her clothes by herself. And then we got a few children. Giacomo and two twin little girls, Ilaria and Federica. Obviously, I cut my hair very short, not to scare them. And and awesome. I mean, we were talking, mentioning chimpanzees earlier. I don't want that they think that, that their father was a chimpanzee. Anyway, Maria Luisa, after the twin girls, Maria Luisa enjoyed collecting pictures, and under a single picture, she would write something, and and. Uh, under this picture, the legend was my flowers, Giacomo, and the two, the two twin girls, uh, and Maria Luisa. You see that even I mean uh, that they are exactly the same. Maria Luisa is much thinner, as you can see. And since then, unfortunately, everything got very worse. We found out that she was seriously ill of a cancer. This is the last picture. Oh, Maria Luisa, since we find out about the disease and her death, it was only very few months. She was suffering. She was in pain here, even prior to the diagnosis of the disease. She was receiving morphine. You can see in her face this was the birthday of Chiara, she died in the terrible pains short after that. She died in Stanford. And on the basis of the experience with her harrowing death, a terrible death, we then set up the foundation on in her name. But about this, we'll talk another thing, another time. This is a, a new, another image of Maria Luisa, the one that was uh, put in the papers when she died, but I think this light and her beauty cannot be described by my words, and this is exactly the way she was dressed. The same dress that she was wearing when she was dead. And then her ashes were dispersed in the Bay of San Francisco. Now, why am I starting with the story of Maria Luisa? Now, let's talk about something else now. Well, at that time, I was a professor at Berkeley. Uh, I was there with all these outstanding colors, Nobel Prizes, chemists, physicists. It was indeed the center of the world technology. I mean, I was coming from Udine in northeastern Italy. I had only studied mathematics and engineering. How can I possibly compete with these people? What do I know about cancer and tumors? And I, I used to ask the doctors, I mean, this nice, energetic, beautiful girl full of life and energy, how is how on earth can she possibly die within a few months? 
I asked the doctors, and especially, uh, is it possible that we got to this point and that we can do nothing about it? And the doctors, medical doctors at that time, gave me a shocking answer considering my ignorance on cancer. Oh, unfortunately, we don't have tests to for an early diagnosis of cancer. I mean, how long, how long does it take before a cancer develops and gets very serious? 10 to 15 years was the reply. How can we not intervene in this long stretch of time? Maybe we can intervene in the genetics of cancer. How on earth is it possible that we have that there's nothing that we can do to help these people? And then another thing that they told me was the heterogeneity of all the cancer, not only between different people, but also in the same person. I mean, at every step of the metastatic cascade, the differences in the metastatic colonies compared to the primary tumor, the differences multiply in um, uh, a person with an advanced stage of the disease, we get to hundreds of different type of tumors in the body, and we have no instruments. I mean, we would need the f right drug to kill these many different types of cancer. So I said, okay, listen, I, I, I understand, I understand this difficult, but it's, these are physical engineering problems. We have to take the drug to the correct spot. I have technical tools, technical instruments, exactly like those that they use for the human genome to analyze a biological te uh, sample slide in its entirety. Obviously, I was very naive, uh, very ingenuous at that time. Ten years later, this paper was published on the front page of Nature Reviews and Cancer, talking about the use of nanotechnologies applied to cancer, and where, in the end, the challenges that had a personal value for me in the light of the story, of my own personal story with Maria Luisa, these were all summarized in in all this work. I was in Stanford and Berkeley. A lot of technologies around me, technologies that could have been used and also according to other people, used to solve those two fundamental problems, finding, discovering the evil, the problem as soon as possible, take giving treatment as soon as possible, discovering as soon as possible whether treatment was effective or not, and also having an impact on the local biology to intensify the, the local treatment. Nanotechnology applied to medicine. Let's go on with the story. I had then the great, great luck of getting married again with Paola. Obvious, isn't it? And then uh, shortly after we found out that Paula was again expecting twins. Again, uh, a couple of girls, twins, heterozygotes, so different. And then there are moments when you think that God is talking to you. I mean, we were there uh, at the ultrasound, uh, looking inside Paula's belly, and uh, and we saw two heads, two people. And there I said, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Paola, grandissima donna, che il Signore appunto la benedica. Now, and Paola, great woman, may God bless her, uh, who had a very important career, decided to come and live with us and look after all of us. And she, in the span of 11 months, she went from zero children to five children. Quite exceptional. 
more recently. This is our family at the NASA in Houston. Don't forget that we live in Houston. Houston, we have a problem. We have the NASA. The ma many of the problems that have to do with the physics of cancer are indeed uh, inspired by space research. And then later I will make reference to this. So what is nanotechnology? What's the definition? Now I don't want to become academic now, but nanotechnologies are very, very tiny things are manufactured uh, by men and their specific feature is that they are very, very small, very small and specific features have to do new chemistry, new physics, new biology. They have these so-called new emerging properties. Now mentioning dimensions, if you think about Dr. Pierotti's presentation, some um, amino acids and proteins uh, are about a few nanometers. The emerging property in biology, when we succeed in combining many different tiny molecules in bigger containers that allow them to work together, this is nothing that get together to make a cell superior function, just the things that only the Lord can. We don't want to do anything like this, but n the nanotechnologies, the ones that I'm involved into, because I had been assembling nano objects for many years, I decided to assemble these nano objects f for more important things because I mean, if we wanted to have an impact on cancer, I mean, these are terribly difficult problems. Uh, Einstein used to say that we have to get to the easiest possible theory without simplifying too much. And I share this opinion. So n nanotechnologies implies that you have you need to have different pieces and assemble them together. But nanotechnologies in cancer is something that has been with us for many, many years. There are groups of drugs in liposomes, for instance, that have been used in the oncological clinics mm, all over the world, which are, have, are already in use. So these are things that have been with us for many, many years. What is important is to do things that are more important than those that we already have now with the change in our profession. And think of the picture of Paula. That was in Ohio. We left California, moved to Ohio because I realized that if I wanted to do something more important in the medical field, which has become the mission of my life, that is to say, attempting to change the energy that stems from deep sorrow, transforming into something useful, the meaning of life, irrespective whether you are religious or not, is that, I mean, you have to transform your pain in something which is useful for other people. I think this is the meaning of my life. So we moved to Ohio to do something more for medicine. I went to the State University in Ohio as an ordinary professor of medicine now. With all my background, mathematics, engineer, I went there as a director of department and ordinary professor of internal medicine. Uh, all obviously because I had done a lot of research and only research. I have never put my hands on a patient. Now this the uh, concept of uh, inter it's an interesting process how I got to the University of Ohio, then we, I had my laboratory, I had all my studies going on, my research, and then I, I said to myself, well, I am now a professor of internal medicine, I go to, to conferences, I write books, but I know nothing, I mean, I know a lot about the tiny topics that I work on, but I know nothing about the, the rest of medicine. So I, st I started to study medicine. It was not part of the story. This is a very interesting moment. I was ordinary professor of medicine and student at the first year of medicine. I was attending classes like anybody else. 
Isn't it ironic? Very interesting. I started at the age of 43. I was going to university with, I mean, the other students could, could uh, have been my, my children. So the first two years are it's only theoretical study on books, and then in the third and fourth you move on to the clinical practice. No, but I was also working full time as a professor, so I needed also some time. I said, let's take a year off for some clinical experience and then stop. But at exactly that time, at the end of the second year, I received a phone call from this gentleman, from this gentleman, Andy von Eschenbach, who is a, of Italian origin, uh, from Calabria. His mother was from Calabria. Andy was at that time the director of the National Cancer Institute, the Federal Institute in the US, which is in charge of uh, cancer research, the most important institution, and, and then became the commissioner of FDA. And Andy, I received this phone call from Andy, Andy von Eschenbach, and I was thinking, well, maybe I have parked my car where I shouldn't have or something like that. It wasn't that. He wanted to tell me, we have heard a lot about nanotechnology. We don't know, even know what it is exactly. But if it is of any help, we want to have it. We want to uh, launch a federal program. So to cut a long story short, I went to them. And I spent the two, follow, uh, subs, the two following years to create the national US program for nanotechnologies applied to cancer, which was then launched in 2005, relaunched in 2009. 700 million of funds, thousands of people in the United States working on nanotechnologies, including Lee Hood, Lee, uh, who has a center with Jimmy Heath and others. So one of those very important moments in life when you have to say to yourself, Let's do the effort of learning more medicine, ending up my clinical experience and become a physical doctor. Or shall I be at the service of the community? Shall I invest energy, time, and money, etc.? And I think it's then a moral obligation if you can do something helpful for them to help the others. It's your duty to do so. Two years at the Federal Service in uh, Washington, Bethesda, Maryland, at the National Institute for Health, setting up the program of oncological nanomedicine. And this is the group, my own advisory board. It's not been very easy. I had to write the, the federal program. They would criticize my work. Then I had to change it, correct it, and then go back to them. Just to give you an idea, I'm sure you have already understood the how important these people are. The majority of these are uh, Nobel Prizes. This is James Watson, just to give you an idea, the father and inventor of DNA. Beth Vogestin, not yet a Nobel para Prize, but will possibly be one of the next. Bob Weinberg, already Nobel Prize. Hardwin, Baltimore, etc. All these really, really outstanding scientists in the, and a great privilege for me. Now, after my service at the Federal Department, I went back to Texas University of Texas very interesting experience for me. I'm very sad to go away. And one of the things that we did was to set up the first department in the history of the world, as far as I know, the first department of nanomedicine within a medical school. Our students, and we are the sixth more important medical school in their four-year program, they are the first class of they can work with new nanotechnologies when they finish, when they become uh, medical doctors. These are the articles in Nature, Nature Medicine, uh, celebrating this fact. In Houston, uh, by the way, and the first three Nobels for nanotechnology have been awarded in uh, Houston, 
especially this gentleman here who died of cancer in 2005, the father of nanotechnologies, the one who discovered together with us of the molecule C60, and also the person who realized that, I mean, in Houston we have the most important medical center in the US and maybe the most important of the world, and they said, why not set up um, an alliance to bring nanotechnologies into the clinical practice? And he invited me to be the first president of the Alliance for Nanotechnology. That's why the reason why I went to Houston. It's it's very hot and sticky in here. Can I take off my jacket, please? Thank you. Now, the four com the four programs for a personalized type of medicine. I think it has to be based on nanotechnology. Nanotechnologies are a prerequisite. You need a lot of molecular medicine. One of the prerequisites to personalize medicine, to go to the right place at the right time, to see whether it works, and to involve uh, the services of biology for this healing process. These are the four programs in my laboratory, one, two, three, and four. We tissue reconstruction. I don't think we have enough time to talk about everything. First of all, Dr. Pierotti mentioned some of the fundamental things, so I can go quickly over this first phase. State of health, I mean our blueprint in, a, in our genes, but the state of health is in the molecules that are uh, produced thanks to the information that are in the gene, so it is related to the proteins largely. 30,000 genes and more than one million uh, proteins in our blood. If we want to pick the right protein from our bloodstream, it is in itself already very difficult because there is this complexity of molecular messages at different concentrations and with different sizes at least 10 different sizes, 10 different concentrations. I am jealous of uh, astronomy, but prote proteomics is much more difficult than astronomics. So it's difficult to find these molecular signatures, detect them, and they are never single proteins that are blue and you recognize it as being blue and you can say, oh, oh, here I have cancer. No, it's a combination of different concentrations, very often imbalanced. And the technologies to detect these information are very complex. That's, th that's where we started. To underline the previous subject, let's take this animal in two different stages of its life. This animal has the same genome, but in terms of uh, a different proteome giving it different features. So our action can only be on the proteome. People with the genome were very lucky. It was a simple problem that could be solved with technologies that now are fairly simple. I mean, I've seen the birth of the technologies as was working. I was working in Berkeley where the first microarrays were created. These microarrays, the spots that Marco has shown, are about 100 micrometers in diameter. Tiny for then, now I can do the same at 10 nanometers. So 100 billion of amplification of data that we can obtain in the same space. So we developed these chips, these nano traps, silica chips to be used on biological fluids to obtain information that for us are expressed as peak intensity, intensity with mass spectrometry. The chemists know what I'm talking about. And we get these things, these nano traps, and uh, surfaces that are very specific with sizes of the nanostructures that are around uh, similar to single nanometers. 
These different surfaces allow us to capture physically and chemically differ different uh, subgroups of the proteome in the blood, in the plasma, so that they can then be analyzed. A practical example is that we are actually cooperating with a group in Padua. It has to do with patients' analysis of the respective proteome in the blood allowing us to classify with no further an analysis, no further tests, precancerous lesions, uh, cancers, treatable cancer, and untreatable cancers. Now, applica uh, implications for the treatment are incredible. We can think of an improved quality of life, treatment, here we have to continue working because, I mean, we have a lot of people that can be rescued. We don't even need to operate these people to perform surgery. We just have to keep an eye on them, uh, hoping that, that things will not progress. And if during the treatment uh, these, these bullets move around, then we know that treatment is functioning. This is the monitoring part and early detection part second. If we imagine that cancer is already there and that cancer is already dangerous, what can we do then? In the story of nanotechnologies, there are many nano drugs, at least some groups of nano drugs available on the market that are based on the fact that blood vessels that are afferent to a tumor are, at least to some extent, different from healthy blood vessels. One of the main differences lies in the fact that we have these fenestrations, I mean, holes, whereby the endothelium is very permeable. These poles, uh, these holes, exactly through them, these nanoparticles can go in and get to the cancer. This is an example of liposomes, first nano vectors in cancer clinics since 1994. So the particle can go in and exert its action. Of course, uh, we have a defense system, we have an immune system, we have our defenses to defend ourselves uh, against external attacks, especially the liver and the spleen are there to capture these particles immediately. This molecule, PEG, allows these nanoparticles to remain free in the bloodstream and exert their action. The first drug which was marketed as a nano drug it was very important for drug adriamycin. So again, Italy uh, among the front runners for nanotechnology. So uh, summarizing the current importance of nanotechnologies in the world, I mean, these are first generation thing, things that are already have already been in clinical use for a long time. Then 97% of the entire research in the world laboratories, including Italy, has to do with functional particles that, have, uh, that have, can play different roles, not only molecular de detection, or c contrast capacity, particles that are active as drugs, without adding no further drugs, other particles that can be activated from outside with external radiation, they are heated and then they cook the tumor, thermal ablation. This second generation, uh, there are at least 20 clinical trials in the world and hundreds of thousands of products that are currently being explored. Going back to the biology, going back to life made up of nanoscopic aspects that get together, start working and generate something which is very powerful, especially if they end up in the same place. Now, I'm also, I'm currently very much interested in the third generation. Why? Well, because 
the fact that we have protective barriers, we have the immune system, and this uh, deflects the majority of uh, our chemotherapeutic treatment, especially if they encounter one of these barriers. I mean, if you want to go to the treasure within the castle, you have to find open doors. So you have to jump over the water, you have to avoid the crocodile, you have to avoid all the dangers, and you have to find all the doors wide open. It's a very physical problem. It's a transport problem, a logical problem. And if all these barriers, one after the other, they are sequential, serial barriers, we have to find vectors, or as I often call them, taxis, that can do sequence actions, I mean one step after the other, the other, and we in Houston, we remember that the other friends, that our friends that got to the moon, I mean getting to the moon is certainly easier than getting to a tumor, but they couldn't have got to the moon on a cannonball, they had to build specific missiles, and we are doing the same with tumors. We are uh, projecting anti-cancer tumors that are multi-stage, multi-stage vector. This is the particle getting to the blood vessel, although uh, we can bore the hole, allowing the particle to go in, and then the we get to the to our destination. There is a lot of mathematics behind this. These particles have our disk shape, not just to remind us all of of UFOs, but also because to remind that there have been very good Italian mathematicians that find out the, how these particles are transported inside our body, in particularly in the blood vessels, discovering that the ideal, or well, there is no ideal form, can only, it has to be customized every time, but the spheric, the round shape, is the word, the worst possible. So this is a problem, but a great opportunity at the same time. So, there is not a shape which is perfect for everyone. There is not one single drug. How do we know what type of vector we need for that specific patient or for that specific lesion or problem? We have to work with the most important radiologists and radiology experts in the world. They developed systems that allow us to visualize um, until the, as far as the smallest capillaries and looking at the vasculature of a specific tumor, they can provide us with information. We then, in the calculation codes, in the project codes, allow us to develop the ideal shape for that specific tumor lesion. So it's not so much for that patient, rather for that lesion. So it's the vector that has to be made to measure, customized. But if the mathematician comes to us and tells us the shape that you need here is a porous uh, half coconut and 30 nanometers of diameter. Okay, now you, you know what we need, but how can you possibly make it? It's not easy because nanotechnologies imply chemistry. So if you, you put something in a bottle, then you shake it at the right temperature for a specific time for thermodynamic reasons, you end up having round shape particles. So this passage is very difficult, but luckily for us, we now have micro the microelectronic science applied to the material technologies, photolithography and silica, the oncomems, and these objects can be reproduced, and we have found a way to make them nanoporous. So first of all, they are then degraded within our body, and secondly, they are like sponges. I 
can fill them with whatever I want and they, they release it gradually in the body. These are the particles. This is the endothelial uptake of PSI particle transmission and scanning of electron microscopy. You have to study the biology of this internalization. I have a team of about 120 to 130, the majority of which are biologists, uh, 40 molecular cellular biologists, and we have engineers, mathematicians. It's like a zoo. Now, as Professor Pirotti was mentioned, I then have a dream, a dream of getting in different parts of the cell. I want to target my uh, treatment specifically in the subcellular components. This is a very recent study where two members of my team were able to demonstrate that I can park some of my particles. I can park them in the endosomes, and they remain there. Some others I can release into the cytoplasm. Some others are taken into the nucleus. I can decide what goes where. And some particles are taken to endosomes, and they can then communicate with the nearby cells. So we end up having a cell-cell communication. Uh, so thanks to this molecular recognitions I can communicate between cells and then and I can tell the other cell and please tell your friend so we can personalize the treatment of the entire neighborhood and to summarize this is a documentary on the French TV I think the Italian right is buying the same documentary we are uh, going beyond the first biological barrier. I think this is the tumor cell. This is the physiological uptake mechanism. The particle going into the tumor cells enters in there into the tumor and starts releasing the drug, the active drug. One of the most recent studies, which in my humble opinion is very important, recently published on cancer research two months ago, and, uh, uh, and and also in other um, newspapers tells us that we can release CIRNA molecules the production of proteins in the expansion and the uh, of the various pathways so this SIR, SIRNA CIRNAs are new drugs that are very much targeted and once they are inside the body we have the circulating nucleases and we have to protect ourselves from pieces of this that come from elsewhere and that could imply a danger so they are immediately destroyed we can have them transported with therapeutic effectiveness and I took the example of the ovarian cancer so if you didn't like that French documentary this is another film this is a green fluorescent mouse with green fluorescence. We, we, you see the blood vessels on this mouse. You see the particles one by one. The red are 600. The, the blue are 1,000 nanometers. And then looking at how they move within the blood vessel, we can mathematically extract pieces of information and then through feedback we can take back to the project maker of the vector and we can then refine the project and get to the ideal place. This is things that you can only see in our laboratory. If you allow me, this was a commercial spot. Again, the front page of Nature and Technology and the front pages of many other important magazines of the past three months so it's obviously a very topical issue now mentioned in the NASA another aspect of NASA a few years ago NASA came back to us and told us we we have uh, decided together with the federal government to take uh, people to Mars by the year 2020 this is the previous program. We have decided, I mean, it's not easy to get to Mars. Oh. 
or it's fairly easy to get there, but if you want to have people there that re are alive, remain alive and come back alive, it takes it takes uh, 10 months to go there and 10 months to come back and the problem is that there are no hospitals nearby on Mars. There is no health care provided. So human biology is perfect uh, for planet Earth, but up there there is a problem of radiation, loss of muscular mass, psychiatric problem. Imagine it's like being three years in a washing machine. There are quite a few serious problems. We would need things very similar to the human glands that are perfect to produce uh, insulin or glucagon for the glycemic balance, but all of these th things are not available in space. That's why we set up the problem nano uh, gland control release of specific hormones from subcutaneous containers using nano channels. It's an example of these nano channels that we invented in Berkeley. These are nano channels that are so small in size that all of these tiny spots that you see here are like atoms. You can measure this because we know the distance between the various colonies of atoms that are here. Now, the transport laws in these nano channels are different from the laws of transport that we have all learned at school. And an example that I could make here, and then led me to write about nanotechnologies that I've shown you in the first uh, slide. So, both passive and active transport, it's a different, uh, different laws of physics, a different, something completely different, and very difficult physics. Also because we have gravity and inertia factors that are very different. So once I said, I wanted to challenge two young physicists that were guests at my place. I had told them, let's go into space. Let's remove gravity so that we can study all the other effects and we can study uh, physics. Uh, these two. participated in a competition and got this Heinlein Prize, so they went to, Na we all together ended up go to NASA, and in January we will go into space. This is the first scientific experiment in a spaceship organized by the private sector. This is absolutely unprecedented. No, ma quello è la cosa importante, la cosa importante è che la scienza che nasce da questo esperimento ci permette di controllare il rilascio in modo di poter personalizzare la legge di rilascio al paziente. In realtà abbiamo un'azienda che sta sviluppando queste cose qua per, 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 la, per la medicina, non ho ancora nello spazio, sono cose importantissime. Pensiamo per esempio a chi deve fare la chemioterapia, deve andarsi in ospedale, sta lì tre giorni con la flebo, eccetera, eccetera, ma per mille altre ragioni in medicina, per la terapia del dolore e altre cose, la possibilità di avere la farmacia sotto la pelle è una cosa che sia dal punto di vista della convenienza che dal punto di vista terapeutico, è di un, un vantaggio straordinario. E tutte queste cose non deve sembrare che siano le tecnologie costose che poi arrivano solo ai ricchi nei paesi ricchi. In realtà una grossa parte del movimento delle nanomedicine, in particolare George Whitesides, Rebecca Richards Cortum e pure noi, ci stiamo... Il modello tipico che si fa si sviluppa una tecnologia, no? pensiamo a una risonanza magnetica, un macchinario grandissimo, costosissimo e poi le, le, le grandi aziende ne regalano qualcuno ai paesi poveri, dico quello è il modello tipico, è il modello che regali, non la stessa cosa per i farmaci, ma è chiaro che la strategia che forse va ripensata e adattata è di partire con questi nuovi strumenti tecnologici, con i pezzi, con i concetti, con le tecnologie nuove, e sviluppare approcci che permettano di diminuire l'ingiustizia nella distribuzione, no, delle, le, le diversità di distribuzione di, 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 di soluzioni ai problemi della salute. Quindi per esempio George, che è un fenomeno, a Harvard ha sviluppato questo chip microfluidico sulla carta. Si può usare dappertutto, si mette lì, si mette nell'acqua, si per vedere se l'acqua è contaminata oppure no. Costa niente, si fa con il, con il, come, si fa, come si processa la carta naturalmente, a, 
Eh sì, però questo è finito l'italiano. Ebbene che cambia argomento. Allora, sono arrivato per vostra fortuna alla fine. Due cosine ancora voglio dire, questi sono i nostri sponsor, abbiamo per fortuna negli Stati Uniti la ricerca è finanziata, è ancora finanziata molto bene e noi abbiamo più o meno un centinaio di milioni di fondi di ricerca nel mio laboratorio e nei laboratori consorziati. La ricerca non va con le sue gambe da sola dal laboratorio in clinica, c'è un solo modo per arrivare in clinica dove vogliamo tutti arrivare ed è un processo di commercializzazione. E noi non ci tiriamo indietro, queste sono tre aziende con le quali abbiamo a che fare, che in realtà ho fondato queste due, che portano in clinica sia, eh, questi sono i chip sottocutanei, qui c'è la proteomica, ci sono i multistadio e questa è un'altra azienda che pubblica sta a Wall Street, quindi io qui ho un interesse economico personale, hereby disclosed. Qui c'è, eh, questa è una piccola parte del mio gruppo, ci sono molti italiani, sono in tutte discipline diverse, come dico abbiamo centinaio, 120, dipende da che giorno si va a contare. E vorrei chiudere tornando a Maria Luisa. Allora, allora eh, chiaramente, come, come avete avuto la pazienza di ascoltare il mio percorso personale un istante, quando è successa la tragedia di Maria Luisa, io mi occupavo di reattività cosmologia, di, di, di cosmologia reattivistica, scrivevo teoremi che poi nessuno leggeva mai naturalmente. Quella è stata una svolta, una chiamata. Chiaramente, come per molti, no? poi non è che è bello parlare in pubblico tante volte ed è un po' imbarazzante, però a conoscere poi chi lavora nella medicina si scopre che tantissime volte la scelta di occuparsi di medicina nasce da cose personali non credo che ci sia niente di cui fare segreto per me chiaramente è stata la chiamata alle armi a quel punto lì non me la sentivo più di fare teoremi sull'evoluzione sull delle galassie non è che voglio criticare chi lo fa ognuno ha la sua vita, ha i suoi percorsi a quel punto lì è stata una chiamata è stata una chiamata chiaramente il tramite della quale è il dolore Dolore è un grande mistero, no? Come il male è un grande mistero in generale per noi tutti, il dolore è un grande mistero. Così come la morte è un grande mistero. E eh, da chiaramente non teologo, hm? mi viene da pensare che se San Francesco parlava della morte come sorella morte, io non mi sento tanto lontano da riconoscere il dolore come fratello dolore. Non che nessuno lo cerchi o lo desideri o lo non fa parte della vita sana naturalmente però è un segno vitale e però è una grandissima sorgente di energia e apre gli occhi Flannery O'Connor, quella scrittrice ho detto giusto? Ecco. di cui c'è la mostra qui vicino c'è questa immagine bellissima che Sofia mi ha raccontato ieri questa immagine bellissima che presenta e dice così come quando si va da una stanza buia si entra in una stanza inondata di luce e di sole, gli occhi fanno male, gli occhi hanno una reazione istintiva di dolore, però si vede di più, però c'è la luce, però c'è il calore, però c'è tutte queste cose qui. Io credo che il dolore è un straordinario portale di comunicazione col nostro Signore e che ci permette di riconoscere Qualche volta la missione, qualche volta i significati, qualche volta non lo so cosa. Fratello Dolore, eh, fratello dolore è una cosa impegnativa, ma credo, eh, come dicevo prima, che alla fine ricordi a tutti noi che la nostra missione, e se c'è modo per, per, per guardarsi... Eh, con serenità nello specchio la mattina, con più serenità, mai con tanta serenità alla fine, ma con un po' più di serenità, è quello di dire questi messaggi dolorosi che mi sono arrivati, in qualche modo, sto cercando al meglio delle mie forze di tradurli in cose per il nostro prossimo, per chi ci sta vicino, per chi soffre. E gli strumenti di questa trasformazione, di questa alchimia dal dolore in energia utile, sono gli strumenti che poi sono le doti che il nostro Signore ha regalato a tutti noi 
tutte diverse, un po' più di questo, un po' più di quello, ma non fa nessuna differenza, ognuno ha le sue. E sono doni, no? E sono doni. E credo che il messaggio doloroso qualche volta ci aiuta a ricordare che questi doni vengono dal Signore e devono tornare a Lui tramite i lavori che possiamo fare al servizio degli altri. Grazie perché non c'è altro da dire uh, di fronte a... I think there's nothing else that, that we can add to a person that opens up his heart just like Mauro did for us today. We can only share this word of thanks to the Lord. I mean, we all have our gifts. These gifts can be, needs to be transformed into something useful for the other. Tanto grazie, sono commossissimo. I obviously touched and moved. Now, Simon of Cyrene. Now, it was in the title, but then I forgot to tell you something. Simon of Cyrene, he was not even from Jerusalem, he was there. And then somebody told him, come here. This poor guy is unable to carry the cross. Help him to carry the cross. And Simon had nothing to do. Well, so why on earth should I help him? Well, I have nothing. What have I got to do with the cross? He's bigger than I, stronger than I. But nevertheless, he took on the cross. It was there by chance. And the very important things in life usually happen by chance. Now, I'm not an expert of these things. I'm not an, uh, he did not say I'm not an expert, I'm not a specialist of carrying the cross. He said, um, they called me, they invited me to carry the cross. I'm here, why not? So he took up the chance. <laughs> 